Louis Patron back with the final segment of the Key West Lou Legal Hour. And once again, I thank you for joining me. I hope you have enjoyed uh, my thoughts as I shared them this, them this morning. I know I will hear from many of you within a half hour of my leaving the studio, and I love hearing from you um, by email, by telephone, people I walk into, on, walk into on the street telling me what they thought about this and that. It, I love the exchanges. The sports world is important to us. And it should be. Now, the Miami Heat basketball team accomplished a great thing. For those of you that are sports fans, you're aware of what I'm going to say. For those of you who are not, let me share this bit of information with you. The Miami Heat basketball team, LeBron James and his friends, they won 27 consecutive basketball games. Almost unheard of. Second most games ever won by a professional team consecutively without losing a game. They won 27 games. They finally lost the other night by four points. I forget to who. Uh, that's not important. The, whatever the team was that won the most was 32 or 33. Apparently, they were going for it. They didn't make it. But you must compliment the Miami basketball team. They have to be absolutely fantastic to win 27 consecutive basketball games. Which then brings me, of course, to Syracuse, which I already talked about. I'm absolutely delighted the Syracuse defeated Indiana last night. We play Marquette on Saturday. Marquette beat us earlier in the year by three points. They're part of the Big East, as Syracuse is. I hope we beat them, because if we win Saturday, then we're into the Final Four. We'll see. I, I, I have been down on my team all year. They've been up and down, and I just stayed down after a while. I didn't think they had it. All of a sudden, they look good. They won something like five out of their six last games. They look great. But it could end. We, you know, one game will kill it. So we shall see. Let's talk about sex education. Sex education in kindergarten. When I went to school, which is a long time ago, when I went to grammar school, I said I went to grammar school from 1940 to 1948. 1940 to 1948, long time ago. They didn't teach sex education. They did not mention the word sex. Uh, and you want to know something? We didn't know anything about it, and we didn't care. It wasn't something on our plate. Then when we got into high school, for me that was 49 to 53, uh, a little bit of sex you'd hear about these things that happened, but you were starting to open, but still... It wasn't as it is today. Grammar school girls weren't getting pregnant. High school girls weren't getting pregnant. My God, I don't think anyone in four years of high school in my school got pregnant. Uh, what a shame under today's standards. But that's the way it was. Today, most of our schools start teaching sex education at the fifth grade in grammar school and then continue with it. Chicago, Chicago, a wonderful town in two years, is going to implement a new program. They're going to start teaching sex education in kindergarten. Sex health, they're calling it, in kindergarten. Maybe it's needed. I don't know. These things are beyond me now. Uh, I don't know. There must, it must be a good reason for it. It must be a good reason that they teach it in the fifth grade. My, my friends who are educators tell me that a lot of girls get pregnant. They have sex boys and girls in grammar school in the higher grades. They tell me that in high school, sex is prevalent. Uh, we didn't know this back then. I find it's an amazing world. It's not a good or healthy situation either. Okay. Sometimes a person will do good in this life and as a result be punished. I'm going to tell you about Paul Marshall C. Paul Marshall C., age 68. He and his wife work for a boys and girls club somewhere in Europe. I don't know where. That Where is not important, but they work for a boys and girls club. Apparently, the tension from the job is extreme. Both of them have been out on disability for months because of stress. Doctor documented stress. They cannot return to work yet. Okay, some point, yes, but they cannot return to work yet. All documented. Nobody cared. The boys and girls clubs were happy with them being out of work for several months because it was justified. So 
Paul and his wife go on vacation to Australia. They have some friends who have a home on a beach on the ocean. And they were having a barbecue on the ocean. And Paul looks out and there's a bunch of little kids, seven or eight little kids, small kids, playing in the water in the, in the surf area, foot and a half, two feet deep. He sees a shark fin. They come in to two feet. Remember Jaws? They come in. He ran out yelling and screaming. And he grabbed, there was a six-foot shark. He grabs it by the tail, and he's pulling it away from the kids. And the shark turns around and nips him a couple of times, but doesn't get a good bite, and he finally throws the shark out. And in the meantime, the kids are running to the beach, and they, none of them got injured, none of them got bit. Thank God none of them got killed. Well, of course, it got publicized, as it should be. The man's a hero. He got fired by the Boys and Girls Club, and the Boys and Girls Club said, if you can afford, if you can be on a beach sunbathing, if you can socialize with your friends, and if you can wrestle a shark, <laughs> you can come to work. And they think it's a fraud he's perpetrated on the system by being there and by not working, and everything is, everything is medically documented. Uh, but they canned him. They, they thought it was injurious to their reputation that their employee who's out on disability is swimming on a beach in Australia and gets all this notoriety. I think Paul got a bum turn. Do you, you recall, I wrote about this six months ago. I talked about it. I, I think I talked about it two weeks ago, too. There is a young police officer, I think his name is Vale, Gilbert Vale, 28 years old, New York City. <coughs> Little perverted, little demented, maybe a lot of both. Uh, he, he came up with a plan on how to kidnap women, and he followed these women. And when he captured them, he was going to torture them. Then he was going to kill them, and then he was going to cook them, and he was going to eat them. For real, not making it up, okay? And he and his wife had split. She went to look on the computer who he was who women were he was screwing around with, and she came up with all the stuff he was doing, turned him into the police. He was charged with attempted murder. He not, never got to kill anybody. And last week, a New York City jury convicted him, okay? And he is going to jail. And, and you know, I think he's going to beat this on appeal because there is no kidnapping in actuality. There's no killing. There's no cooking. There's no eating. No one was harmed. They charged him with a conspiracy to kill, and for a conspiracy, you need what we call an overt act. You must take a step towards it. I don't see the step. Let's see if I'm right. Six, to, six months to a year from now, we're going to find out if an appellate court overthrows his conviction. Okay? Well, that's it for this week. Thank you for joining me. Join me again next week. Read keywestlu.com, my blog. Listen to my blog talk radio show, please, on Tuesday nights. I'll see you next week, my friends.